Good morning. Good Thursday morning. And uh, I'm a little late here and I haven't quite checked my uh, my volume level here. So before I go too far, I'm going to make sure that you can hear me okay. Let's see. System settings. Uh, let's see. Sound. Yeah, it seems like I'm high enough. Well, maybe I'm not high enough, but I'm high enough vocal. All right, enough said. Yesterday, uh, uh, I sort of opened up in a new Oki and Magic uh, uh, can of worms with my discussion of uh, uh, like the two sides of the coin of, uh, of the quintessential element spirit. And we uh, uh, talked about the Enochian Tablet of Union and things like that. Um, but there, I want to talk about another uh, uh, Enochian-related document, uh, which is a Crowley Enochian-related uh, document uh, called The Vision and the Voice. And uh, The Vision and the Voice, uh, well, I'll read about it here in just a second, is very uh, important. It's a series of visions that Crowley re received working the Enochian uh, system of, uh, of magic. It's an exploration of the 30 Aethers. And uh, his particular series of uh, uh, visions uh, related not only to the, the consciousness of existence, but, but to his own uh, personal journey of, of, of initiation. And, and we're left sort of with uh, the challenge of uh, trying to apply the, the structure and momentum of his series of visions uh, to, to our own initiatory journey. Anyway, perhaps those of you who are first introduced to uh, uh, magic or Thelemic magic in particular, uh, most often I hear people say, well, I started with the Thoth Tarot deck. The Thoth Tarot deck was my, uh, was my drug of <laughs> entry level drug. Uh, and uh, and I've uh, written several books on on it, but uh, the, probably the most uh, thorough is my understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot. And I'm going to just read a short uh, uh, a section from that today. But uh, for those of you who are totally unfamiliar with uh, with that, but who are familiar with tarot, you might when you first open up a pack of uh, the Thoth Tarot, you might uh, immediately notice that instead of the judgment card, which shows an overtly biblical uh, scene of the angel Israfel blowing the trumpet on Judgment Day or Resurrection Day, and uh, Corpses rising from the from the tomb. We've got a female corpse there, and a male corpse there, and a little baby corpse there, making the sign of Apophis and Typhon. Okay, and uh, they're making different uh, signs, and they're all rising from their uh, from their sepulchers. Now, in the Thoth Tarot, we have this. It's called the Aeon. Now, both, both cards in the Kabbalistic system uh, are attributed to the element fire. One of the th three primary elements of Kabbalah, fire, water, and air. Earth being something 
Very special. Uh, so they're they're both fire, okay, and they they both even though it, it's not uh, actually shown on the the judgment card here, uh, is attributed to the the Hebrew letter sheen. Well, the the sheen is really shown there, uh, and perhaps we might even interpret those those. Uh, characters in those flames, that, that consuming flame and creative flame, as more or less having their parallel in the images there. So we notice that there is this. But the, the whole form of the, the card is a, is a version of the stele of revealing. And if Duquette was, yes, Duquette was kind enough to it's sort of a stylized, beautiful stylized image of that. You see Nuit and you see Hadit, but you see a full frontal of, uh, of Horus there. And surrounding Horus, you got his twin brother in sort of a large ghost-like uh, uh, transparent image, Hurpar Krat. So there's Horus, the wild and crazy active uh, side of Horus, and then you've got the the silent passive Hurpar Krat. So you'd probably immediately notice that we've got a big difference between that and that. Okay. Now you may also notice in the chariot card okay we've got uh, and this is the hebrew letter chet and that's sort of a standard uh, version we got a full he's he's under a canopy of stars he's, he's cancer uh, attributed to the zodiac sign Cancer. He's drawn by a couple of uh, sphinxes there who are countercharged white and black, positive and negative. And uh, you might not catch those little diagrams on his uh, on his skirt there are uh, are geomantic symbols, symbols of geomancy. But uh, anyway, so that's sort of the, and he's got sort of the crowned with, with stars and under the starry canopy, okay? And that's uh, number seven. But in the Thoth Tarot, you, know, you notice very many similarities. Only we got uh, four uh, sphinxes uh, who were all countercharged. They, uh, uh, each of the Sphinx uh, carries all four uh, elemental attributes, but in different places, in the same way as the four elemental tablets of the uh, of uh, Enochian magic. Each have their uh, their uh, sub elemental sub angles: fire, fire, water of earth, earth of air, etc. And uh, but. Uh, uh, each takes a different precedence, so that the the air of air of the air of the air tablet would be foremost, and earth of the earth tablet would be more bull like. And so, if you look at each of those uh, different sphinxes, you'll see that they've they've each got uh, all four characteristics, but in a little different uh, little different order. And you'll also notice that uh, he has, and it's hard to tell because the coloring of the, of the wheels and such hides it, but he's got a red cape around him there. See, it's joined at the neck, and it is lined in white, which is kind of hard to see, but you can see it sort of in the background by the amber pillars there. And he's showing us what he's got in that cup. So that's a little bit different than this. 
We don't even see the cup in this one. Okay, so there's that difference. Uh, another thing you may notice, it's a little different from the kind of the standard weight deck. Uh, is, uh, well, let me find one here. I thought I had one right out. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look. Well, first of all, there is uh, the universe card. And here we see the Karubic images in uh, the corners. Now, Karubic symbols of the fixed sign of the zodiac. Aquarius for the angel of Aquarius, the eagle of Scorpio, Leo the lion, and Taurus the bull. So those are the fixed signs of the zodiac. So we could, we could project a zodiacal wheel on here. And those, those uh, uh, landmarks, we could, we could rotate it till, we, till all those landmarks fall into place. And if you're interested in Nokian magic elemental tablets, the sub-angles of, of each elemental tablet in that corner is the fire subangle, the water subangle, the air subangle, and the earth subangle. Okay, we we see that, and uh, we see it probably in another couple cards. But I'm going to quickly locate another in the Thoth Tarot. We have cards that also contain those Karubic images. Jeez, here we go. The Hierophant has those Karubic images, but take a look. The angel on the Thoth image is up there on the right. And the eagle is up there on the left. That's a difference. Now, did Crowley change positions in the zodiac of uh, between Aquarius and Scorpio? No. Th this is still, this corner here is still Aquarius. And this corner here is still Scorpio. But now the image of Scorpio and, Aqu and Aquarius has been has has switched. Scorpio is an angel man and and uh, Aquarius is now an eagle. Where do we get that information? We get that information in the vision and the voice, the subject of today's talk. Okay, then of course we've we've uh, another big difference. The strength card. Okay, number eight. Now the strength card has always shown. Well, it shows a. Uh, a woman with that infinity sign above her head. A pretty woman, usually, uh, with her arms around the neck of a lion. And, it, and we don't know whether she's opening the lion's mouth or closing the lion's mouth or just scratching under its chin. But it's a cozy relationship. Now, even in the old, old days, in the early days of Tarot's creation, this has always been a blind for Babylon and the beast. It's always been that. And so in the book of Thoth or the Thoth Tarot, 
we're more overt. We've moved from PG to, if not X, R-rated. Okay, and it's right in your face. So there's, there's that. Okay, and we got the lover's card. There's uh, uh, the woman looking up at the angel and the man looking at the woman. That's, that's kind of how it always goes. Uh, but in the Thoth Tarot, we've got a more elaborate uh, uh, version with uh, even more characters, uh, which has a greater sort of alchemical uh, significance when you hear Crowley's uh, commentaries on that. So, all of that being said, I just wanted to drive home the point that the uh, vision and the voice is an extremely important document when attempting to understand the shift of cosmic consciousness that the new aeon is uh, uh, supposed to represent or is trying to represent in the form of, of these tarot cards. Now, very early on uh, in, the, in the chapter about little bits of things you should know about the Thoth tarot, where I talk about the Golden Dawn, I talk about the um, uh, Lady and the Beast, the things you should know about uh, Crowley and, and uh, Harris. Chapter 4 is about the art of the Thoth Tarot. Chapter 5 is the prophet in the Book of the Law, why Crowley uh, audaciously calls himself a prophet. Uh, and then uh, here's the Aeon of Horus, where I, I explain the, the uh, Aeon of Horus and the two Aeons that preceded it. Okay. Uh, but, Chapter 7 is called The Vision and the Voice. And it's only two pages, so don't uh, think I'm going to bore you to, too much to death. It begins with an uh, epigraph uh, right from the vision and the voice. This is the secret of the Holy Grail. Well, actually, this is from uh, Lieber Het. And Het is that chariot. Okay. This is the secret of the Holy Grail. That is the vessel of Our Lady, the Scarlet Woman. Babylon, the mother of abominations, the bride of chaos, that rideth upon our Lord the Beast. Now, we must briefly address an essential component of the Thoth Tarot that many people, that for many people, demands an open mind. I'll wait while you open your mind. Okay, but it also requires a great deal of spiritual courage. During his lifetime, this all-important aspect of Crowley's work was understood and appreciated only by a tiny number of his students. Unfortunately, it still remains the source of much controversy and misinterpretation. It is of particular interest to us because several of the trump cards of the Thoth Tarot are Lady Harris's dramatic renderings of a series of complex and curious visions. Visions that communicate in symbols and words the shifts of character among the titanic forces that bring an end to one spiritual age and the beginning of another. Some of these visions are intoxicatingly beautiful, and some are dark and terrifying. Some seem to wallow in blasphemies. All of them, like visions recorded by prophets of old, need a key 
to unlock their meaning or even begin to unlock their meaning. When he was a child, Crowley's exasperated mother called him the Beast 666 whenever she thought he was being naughty. Later in life, he would discover Kabbalistic uh, significance to this term and this number and go on to identify his life and work with his understanding of its esoteric meaning. This is very disturbing to many people. It's understandable that anyone with a Christian background would recoil in horror when he or she first encounters Crowley's shocking use of words and images such as the Beast 666, the Scarlet Woman, All Father Chaos, the Horror of Babylon, or Blood of the Saint. While these dark blasphemies effectively serve to screen out the faint-hearted dabblers and all who choose to remain self-blinded by superstition, they offer a radiant and altogether wholesome spiritual treasure for anyone bold and tenacious enough to do a little research and a little meditation. As we discussed in the previous preceding chapter, Crowley taught that we stand at the threshold of a new aeon, a period of profound intellectual and spiritual growth and self-realization. In order to illustrate the evolutionary forces at work at this pivotal moment, he employed a venerable but easy to misinterpret literary device. He proceeded to hijack many recognizable terms, images, visions, and characters of the Egyptian, Hindu, Greek, Hebrew, and Christian mythology. He transmuted their character and significance in order to communicate a new message, a message for the ears of modern men and women whose rapidly expanding consciousness has now equipped them to perceive objective and spiritual realities that would have been incomprehensible to seekers of only a few generations ago. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the modern generation of people are any smarter or any wiser or possess any more common sense or wisdom than our parents our grandparents or our great-grandparents. What I am saying is there are things that we easily accept and absorb, especially things concerning the universality of spiritual subjects that would have just blown their minds and they could, couldn't even grasp it. And I'm just talking one or two generations ago. But I digress. In other words, Crowley took old, terrifying concepts such as the Whore of Babylon and the Beast 666 and in his own way redeemed them to represent glorious things, as sacred and holy as the concepts of the Madonna and child were in the Aeon of Osiris. He did this not as a cold-blooded exercise of intellectual gymnastics, but by personally experiencing a series of ceremonially induced visions that communicated these truths to him in a language of scriptural imagery with which he was already intimately familiar. And that just happened to be recognizable to much of the Western world, too. Oh, yeah, I, I, I speak Whore of Babylon, you know. Oh, yes, I speak B666. 
Isn't that bad? Okay. Foremost among these visions are those he experienced in November 1900 while mountain climbing in Mexico. Those were the first couple. And between November 23rd and December 19th, 1909. This is after he received the Book of the Law. He got most of them. And he got them while walking across the North African Sahara. A record, <coughs> excuse me, of these 30 visions was first published as Liber 418, The Vision and the Voice, in the spring of 1911, and as a supplement to the equinox. They are the source and the key to the spiritual doctrines of Thelema including the almost universally misunderstood theogony of the goddess Babylon and the All-Father Chaos. And I'm sure I got a footnote here. I'm sure the, the note uh, attributes the goddess B Babylon to uh, number three on the Tree of Life and the All-Father Chaos to number two on the tree of life. Hokma, Bina, Shiva, Shakti, Beast, Babylon. Obviously, these visions were intensely personal and on one level dealt specifically with Crowley's own initiatory career. On another level, one that should be of particular interest to us, they were also revelations concerning the universal initiation that humanity and the world is undergoing at this pivotal moment in human evolution. He categorized these initiatory events in the same progressive order as the ten degrees of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which represented a spiritual ascent up the Tree of Life. While all the degrees are important and represent levels of human consciousness, the fifth degree, which is the Sephiroth number six on the tree of life, that's why they say five equals six. It's the fifth degree concerning the sixth Sephiroth. Okay. Uh, and the eighth degree, and the eighth degree is uh, uh, <coughs> Bina, number three, the first uh, part of the supernal triad directly above the abyss. And that's uh, three equals eight, or eight equals three. Uh, the fifth degree and the eighth degree are major landmarks along the spiritual path of return. And Crowley makes frequent references to them in the Book of Thoth. In the fifth degree, Adeptus Minor, or Lesser Adept, the aspirant achieves union with the knowledge, with the Holy Guardian Angel, a spiritual entity unique to each of us, who once attained, serves as our divine companion, mentor, and guide. I'll talk more about uh, Holy Garden Angel in chapter 11. The eighth degree, Magister Templi, or Master of the Temple, is most terrible and represents the single most profound moment of our incarnation. It is faced only when the initiate has achieved a level of consciousness so high that in order to proceed farther, requires the abandonment of all old machinery of self-identity and perception. It means, quite literally, the annihilation of everything that the individual has heretofore believed to be the com components of personality and self. In other words, you can't take anything across the abyss that isn't essentially you. Now, before you throw up your hands and dismiss all of this as just complex and ridiculous delusions of a cult of 19th century eccentrics, 
Please pause and keep in mind that terms such as the Holy Guardian Angel and the Abyss are simply convenient terms for universal spiritual experiences that in other times and cultures are known by other names. Once we grasp the basic concepts, we discover that the angel and the abyss, we can discover them in the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Chaldean Oracles, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, in Plato, in Socrates, and even in the Old and New Testament. No matter how these initiations may present themselves, no matter by what name we choose to label them, every human being, indeed every unit of evolving consciousness, will eventually wed the angel and face the ordeal of the abyss. Even so, it is understandable that you would ask why any of us should be concerned with the bizarre visions of one man whose morals we may find repugnant, whose vocabulary of images are an affront to most of the world's great religions, and whose sanity is still a subject of debate. I must confess it took years before I began to appreciate the archetypal essence of the vision and the voice and realize how extremely fortunate I was to possess such a document. Once I shed a few superstitions and fears and carefully examined Crowley's symbolic images and words, I found it to be not only an eloquent and colorful example of one person's initiatory adventures, but also a valuable road map to my own spiritual journey. I wish space allowed me to discuss the vision and the voice in detail, but that's been done admirably in the vision and the voice with commentaries and other papers. Uh, I'm sure that that is now long out of print. Uh, and it provides an in-depth study of the wondrous visions uh, and brings to light the spiritual reality of many tarot images. I hope this chapter has assuaged any anxiety you may have harbored concerning the true spiritual nature of the, quote, blasphemies, unquote, that seem to spew from Crowley's works, and that you are now prepared to learn more about the Thoth Tarot fearlessly without freaking out at the mention of things as Babylon or the beast or the blood of the saints or the scarlet woman or chaos or the mother of abominations. Okay, that's what I had to say in understanding Crowley's Thoth Tarot. Now, how do you get a vision and the voice in this day and age where much Crowley material that uh, has in the recent past been in print and currently is not? Uh, I helped curate and edit uh, a, a series of three books. Uh, inexpensive paperback books uh, for the good folks at Wiser Books, Red Wheel Wiser. And they're called the Best of the Equinox series. And there's uh, one on dramatic ritual that includes rites of Eleusis. And there's one on sex magic. And all this material from the Equinox, okay, from the 10 volume set of Equinox, uh, volume one, uh, numbers one through 10. And there's one on Enochian magic. And the entire vision and the voice is included in that one little paperback book. And that's available uh, from Amazon, directly from Wiser, I'm sure it's in Kindle, too. Okay. It's called the Best of the Equinox series. The publisher is Red Wheel Wiser or Wiser Books. Uh, there's three volumes. Choose the volume that's, that says, uh, oh, well, get them all. They look good there on, on your shelf. Uh, 
But if you want the vision and the voice, just the pure vision and the voice, not only that, but his Libra Hanok tells you how to how to actually do Enochian magic. Uh, avail yourself of, of that. Uh, do it right now. It, well, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's it for today. I thought it was only going to be about two minutes today, but uh, uh, we've obviously gone over. Uh, I'd like to shout out uh, a shout out to uh, 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 Doug and Karen James, our oldest and dearest friends uh, of the OTO. Uh, they are truly OT OTO uh, uh, heroes of the 20th and 21st uh, uh, century, uh, organizationally and, and uh, spiritually speaking. They came down from Oregon to pay us a visit yesterday. We had a very nice lunch and it reminded me how much uh, how much the OTO as a fraternal organization can mean to people. So big shout out. And uh, just a few days before, our good friend Michelle Catlett, who I could say the same wonderful fraternal love words to uh, paid us a visit to. So uh, we've had a happy spring. And uh, we feel energized magically. Anyway, until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.